So not last Sunday, but Sunday before that, we started this look at Daniel chapter 6, commonly known as Daniel in the lion's den. What was a one-week lesson has turned into three at least. I'm really going to try and get finished today, but I don't have a lot of faith in that. We'll see where it goes. But there's so much. This is one of the things, again, that I love about my job. Here's a story that's very well known. I mean, it's a story that, that those that grew up in the church saw it on flannel graph. Uh, we've seen coloring books with Daniel and Lions Den. We've seen cartoons. I, I remember a cartoon on a Saturday morning some 50 years ago, 55 years ago now, of Daniel and the Lions Den. And I was always fascinated by the story. And what's beautiful is when you get into Scripture and you dig into it and you look at it, as God presented it and ask God what he's saying in these things, we see some layers peeled away, not just from the, the main story, because it, it, it all flows out of the main story, but how God's sovereign, sovereignty is illustrated and presented over and over in different ways and from different angles and different lights, whatever metaphor you want to use there. And it is wonderful. It's just so much fun. And so that's what I'm trying to share with you over the, these uh, these extra weeks, shall we say, where, um, where we're digging in a little bit deeper. So we started out by looking kind of at a timeline of Daniel. And I want to say thank you to Gary. So he very, very kindly pointed out something that I had kind of forgotten. And it's it's very easy as, as you dig in to forget something that you shouldn't forget, but that, you know, we just, we're just, we're just, we're human. There are some questions concerning the dating of many of the books of, of Scripture. Um, and in all honesty, historical dates preceding the day of Jesus and even for several centuries after Jesus, mixed messages, mixed references. And so there's, there's a... a a question mark in some of these. This happens with Daniel. Um, Darius is, is never identified in other historic documents. Cyrus is, the very last sentence of Daniel 6, says that Daniel, um, well, prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Well, Cyrus was the king, and so they're thinking that Darius was the guy that they sent in to take over and that's what happened at the end of chapter five. Nebuchadnezzar, I think, believe it's Nebuchadnezzar. No, I forget. Um, no, Belshazzar, king of Babylon, of the Babylonians, was slain. Darius comes in and takes over. So he may have been a general or an administrator acting on Cyrus's behalf. And so when Daniel six says that he prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian, some say it's one and the same. There's also questions as to the exact date of when the exile happened or when the, the first uh, kids were brought over. Now, it's not a great big it's 10 to 15 years-ish. So last week I was saying that Daniel was 80-some-odd years old or 70-some-odd years old. So it, it's in that time frame somewhere. The point remains the same, which Gary, again, was kind to, to point out. The point remains the same. Daniel served decade upon decade upon decade in this enemy camp. And he did so with such expertise and gusto and integrity that he was promoted. Wildly promoted to second in command. And in doing so, upset a lot of born and raised folks. We began by saying that the key to Daniel chapter 6, and really the key to all of the book of Daniel, and really the key to all of the Old Testament, and really the key to all of the New Testament. So really the key to all of Scripture 
is that Yahweh God is sovereign. And that's easy to say, and it's easy to, to agree with, right? But the question is, what does that mean to a rooted life? And that's really what we've been trying to dig into and figure out. And Daniel is a beautiful example of us, for us, of what a rooted in the sovereignty of God life looks like. That was week one. And we said that understanding and trusting God's sovereignty, sovereignty focuses our purpose, decreases our stress, and increases our joy. Then last week, we saw how there's this beautiful idea of that Daniel was so faithful to God in every moment of every day that the people that tried to find a way to get him thrown in jail or kicked out of his position or just to take some of his you know, mojo away, whatever, the only way they could figure out to do it because they, they looked at all of his documents, they looked at all of his work, everything was great, above reproach, no fault in it. So the only thing they could do was somehow trick the king into getting Daniel for doing what they always knew Daniel was always doing, which was continually serving God. What a great testimony to a faithful life. The only way to get to him was through his continual service to God. I wish that could be said about my life. That would be a great, what's that called, an epitaph on a, on a headstone? Mm. So Daniel's enemies, those that were jealous, the only way to get to him was to somehow make what they knew he would always be doing, serving God, somehow make that an issue. We didn't get to look very much at the king's love for Daniel, but we did talk about that last week a bit. And it's important to remember that his excellent service was to an enemy king. One of the big points in Daniel is that you can serve a Jew could serve in a Gentile environment and still please God and be very pleasing to God. To us that translate, you can work for a non-Christian boss, a non-Christian company, whatever it is, and you can still bring the presence, the peace, the joy of God into that place by the service that you provide your employer. Daniel made such an impression by his excellent service that his value was staggering to the point where this foreign kid as he grew in wisdom and in age and in, in excellence of service, was again elevated to second in command of the entire kingdom. Reminds me a little bit of Joseph's story, doesn't it? This is not a one-off thing. This is not a, hey, this happened to Daniel and never happened to anybody else. This is a lesson for the ages that a rooted life in a sovereign God, God will use for his purposes. We may not understand them. We may not see them. But where we are, God has planted us. Serve him well by serving others, those that he has planted you around. If we are angry and we attack and we whine and we complain, we will never gain an ear and letters will never be written. Remember after the fiery furnace, King Nebuchadnezzar wrote an empire-wide letter saying to honor and worship and praise the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. King Darius does the same thing when Daniel is pulled from the lion's den. He writes a letter to the entire kingdom. and says, you must fear and reverence the God of Daniel.
Had Daniel been a whiner, had Daniel said, oh, I can't wait to go home. Oh, I'm at the, I'm in this bad kingdom and they don't love God. And I just, I'm stuck out here by myself. Wah, 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 wah. The ambulance would have come and taken him off. And that letter never would have been written. And we wouldn't have this example of what a rooted life in a sovereign God looks like. Remember, you are writing your own life's letter. Bloom for God where you're planted. Don't spend energy whining and fighting. Serve with integrity. And let your Christianity be up front. Daniel didn't hide it. The king knew. I mean, he, that was one of the phrases he used. The God whom you continually serve, may he save you. I'm preaching last week's lesson all over again. Sorry. It's just such a good, oh, I just love it. So not to think, you know, I, I don't want to leave you with the impression that this is the only place that this idea comes out. Matthew 25, 40, in that the sheep and the goats, remember that uh, story that Jesus tells about who's going to get into heaven and who's going to not? It's those that serve the least of these. The king will reply. The king, Jesus is speaking. Jesus is the king. Jesus will reply, the king will reply, the sovereign will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. When we serve one another, we are serving Jesus face to face. Something for us to keep in mind. But not only that, whatever you do, Colossians chapter 3, Paul echoes this. Whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Father through him. Whatever you do, wherever you are, whatever the moment is, you are representing, you are speaking to, you are serving God Almighty. We are to live in the name of the Lord Jesus. A couple of decades ago, and then about 100 years before that, it was what would Jesus do? bracelets, bumper stickers, WWJD, all over the place. It's actually really good theology. And the idea is to get so close to Jesus and to know him so well and continually feed on the word of God, who is Jesus, that we know what Jesus would do because we are becoming more and more like Jesus. Unless we think that's the only time Paul said anything about it, Ephesians chapter 6. When he's talking, he says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then he uses the marriage example. And then he uses parents to children. And then he says, slaves to masters. Do you hear that? Slaves to masters. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear. Fear there is the same word that's used to fear God. And with sincerity of heart, you hear that? Not just to get your own way, not just to get your own goods, but with sincerity of heart, I really want to do the absolute best for my slave master. That's a hard pill for Americans to swallow, but there it is in black and white. Obey them, not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but as slaves of Christ doing which Paul called himself time after time after time, he was a slave, a servant of Jesus doing the will of God from your heart, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. It's exactly what Daniel was doing. Daniel was really nothing more than a slave in that kingdom. And yet he served wholeheartedly as if he was serving the Lord. And because he served with that kind of integrity, with that kind of focus, with that kind of passion, with that sincerity of heart, he was elevated in rank and position until he became second in all of the kingdom. And he had the king's ear and he transformed the king's heart, captured the king's heart. And the king sent out that letter. God works through us when we serve others as if we are serving him face to face. It's not a one-off in Daniel 
or even a two-off in Daniel because you have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's over and over throughout Scripture, this idea of live from a different perspective, live from a rooted perspective in the sovereign God Almighty. We have to trust that God knows what he's doing, that in the places that he has put us, he's put us there for a reason, and that is to shine his eternal light, not our whiny honeys. And I say that, and you notice who I'm pointing to. We need a perspective shift. We need to be known as people who serve Yahweh joyfully and continually and with sincerity of heart as we serve others. We need not to be surprised when this ticks off other people. I think that's one of the reasons it's in Daniel, because it's going to. People are going to try to see that, try to figure out where we're ingenuous. They'll try to knock us down. They may become jealous. We shouldn't be surprised by it, nor should we allow it to curb our enthusiasm. Anyone? Okay. Our job, in quotes, our duty to God, our great joy before the sovereign King of Kings is to, serve, is to serve whomever God has put into our path as if we are directly serving his, because in God's eyes, that's exactly what is happening. If we are truly servants of God, we serve others knowing that we are serving God as we serve others, even if they are outsiders even if they are enemies. In that context, doesn't the phrase, love your enemies, make a lot more sense? And you will get people ticked off at you. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, Jesus said in Matthew 5, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see the perspective they're living in even while on this earth? Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They are operating from a heavenly point of view, from a deeply rooted point of view. They are in communion with God Almighty as they serve and as they are being persecuted. Blessed are you when people insult you, he continues. Perse when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, Jesus said. Rejoice and be glad. Because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Doesn't that make sense in the context of Daniel? If people are upset at you because of whom you continually serve, yay! Way to go, you're doing something right! When I was in youth ministry, there was a, a publication by... Um, some folks that they thought were felt like they were in charge of making sure that all the churches of Christ in the area, although we are, are all autonomous, were all staying in step correctly. And as youth ministers, we really tried hard to get written up because we felt like if they wrote us up, we were doing something right. I made it. Yeah, yeah, I did. We, uh, in one side note, totally unrelated, uh, we had a cappella come in for a Monday night youth devotional, and uh, Tim Halstead and I introduced them. And I, I said, All right, let's get, I forgot what the first phrase was. Let's get something and funky for Jesus. And we brought them out. Well, that phrase got written up in the rag as some youth minister in quotes. So, anyway. I got a lot of high fives from the guys, so it was, it was fun. Anyway. Anyway. <laughs> so, all right. So this week, now we've got to this week. Let's begin a deep, deeper dive into Daniel 6. Again, this week's deeper dive, as we've actually just been doing for three weeks now. And as we do, let's allow Paul's words in Romans 13 to kind of echo in our minds. 
Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. You think Daniel kept that one in his hip pocket? If robes had pockets, I don't know if they did. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Are we, are we listening? And I'm, I'm going to be very brave here. Republicans, are we listening? And if there's a Republican in office, I would say Democrats, are we listening? If God is sovereign, that should change many attitudes. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebe rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment upon themselves. Ouch. Even as citizens, we can serve a government we do not agree with. We have the right and the privilege to exercise our voice, our discontent. But as Christians, we are also to make sure that our service far exceeds our bitterness, our questions, our anger, our opposing opinion. Because our sovereign opinion should be, God is sovereign. He's got this. How can I work within it to bring God's kingdom to bear in this moment? You see the per perspective shift there? Something I'm still working on. You know, some of these things, it's, it's easy to say. It's easy to pull. It's not easy. Some of these things that I bring out, believe me, I'm struggling and wrestling with them. But the truth needs to be said, even if I'm not, even if I'm not there yet, I need to share what God's truth is because at least I'm, I'm trying to get there. And I think that as long as we're trying to get there, God has a great deal of grace for us. We should apply that not only to ourselves, but those we don't agree with. Does that make sense? Okay. Oh, boy. Three points for today. Two of them we're going to go through pretty quickly. One of them I've already touched on, so we'll just wrap it up. Daniel chapter 6 shows people scheming to get Daniel. And one of the beautiful things, as we've mentioned, is that the only way they can do that is by figuring out some way to make something about his God illegal because he's just such a man of integrity. And they know that he's serving this God continually. There's got to be something they can do, and which is what they do. And they, they make it illegal to pray. And then they just wait for him to do what he always does. And they turn him in. They schemed against Daniel to knock him down. That's the worldly way. The deeply rooted life that, that believes in the sovereignty of God, here's Jesus' words, and to love our enemies. And to love is not the ooey-gooey feeling. It is the purposeful planning to bless. Not just the purposeful planning, but the purposeful planning and effort to bless another. Daniel's concern was to serve the king, even if it be an enemy king. Nowhere in Daniel 6 does it say anything about his attempting to justify himself before the king. King, they, they tricked you, you know, to try and get back at him. The king did that all on his own. Daniel just served and took his punishment took his sentence, and just served. Jesus tells us to love our enemy, to purposefully pray for and purposefully effort towards blessing those 
that are against us. That keeps us from getting too big for our britches. Because that means we have to trust that God knows what he's doing when he told us to do this. And like the kid that's been caught with the cookie out of the cookie jar when he wasn't supposed to get it, and he walks back to the cookie jar, kind of stomping his feet, puts it up there, drops it in. He didn't want to do it, but he did it because mom and dad told him. Sometimes that may be the way we're doing it, although we need to work on our countenance too. But whether we like it or not is not the issue. Whether it makes us feel good or not is not the issue. Whether it will ever result in this person being transformed or saved is not the issue. The issue is, those are all God's issues, by the way. Those are up to God. What's up to us is loving our enemy. God's in charge of the results. All right, point number two. There's this interesting wordplay in Daniel chapter six between a Hebrew word for rescue and a Hebrew word for slave. Now I'm coming out of save. I'm coming out of, oh no, where did it go? Seriously. Oh, I already separated. It's over here. That's interesting that these two words are only found in Daniel. <clears throat> They're found in other documents, historic documents, but not in Scripture. They're very closely related, and yet there are distinct differences. In Daniel chapter 3, there's a word, netzal, that is used three times. In chapter 6, it's used twice. It's used in chapter 3 once, chapter 6 twice. In the decree that Nebuchadnezzar sends, he says, Therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces. <laughs> That's harsh. And their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save Netzal in this way. In Daniel 6, it's in verse 14, when the king heard this, he was greatly distressed and he was determined to rescue, that's the other word, Daniel, and made every effort until sundown to save him. Daniel 6, 27, in King Darius's letter to the kingdom, speaking of God, describing God, he rescues and he saves that's all. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He has rescued, that's the other word, Daniel from the power of the lions. Now remember in the Jewish context, to have two witnesses is to verify. So I think that in these two places in Daniel 6, it's used twice so that when, when Jews read this or, or were read to, someone read this to them, they would think along those lines. This is, this is the same thing, two different ways. This is heavy. This is real. This is verified. Now, that's all. The, the word that's translated save in the NIV, NIV is to extricate, to deliver, to save from immediate danger. It's a physical saving. The other word is a fun word to say, shazib. It means to deliver and to rescue and can mean in the physical, but also in the emotional uh, and, and also the metaphorical sense, the, the bigger sense. It's used in Daniel chapter 3, three times, and in Daniel chapter 6, three times. Actually, it's used in three places in Daniel 3. It's actually used four times in Daniel 3. And four times in Daniel 6, although it's three places. We'll get to that in a second. So, in Daniel 3.15... When the decree has been issued to bow down to the to the golden idols, and when you hear the the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I have made, very good. This is I'm sorry. This is when the king has given him one last chance. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately to a blazing furnace. Then what God, little G, 
will be able to rescue you from my hand, to deliver you. What God can trump my power of fire? A couple of verses later, the three boys respond, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. Goes on to say, but even if he does not, we will not bow down. So the three knew that there was a level of deliverance, a level of rescue that is greater than the physical sense. There's something here that is beyond. And that is what they were serving. That is what they were loyal to. That is what they stood up for. Daniel 3, 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the gods of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and rescued his servants, delivered his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their own lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Isn't it amazing how in Scripture the unsaved often have the deepest words of salvation come from their lips? when they see and experience through others' faithfulness the sovereignty of God. That's the position God puts us in at times when we're uncomfortable and when we don't like it and when we think things are bad. God is perhaps putting us in a situation to reveal his glory if we are faithful in that moment. Daniel chapter 6. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. He wanted to deliver Daniel in the largest sense of the word, and he wanted to extricate him from that moment, from that lion's den. A couple of verses later, so the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. And the king said to Daniel, may your God whom you serve continually rescue you, deliver you, more than extricate, more than save. May your God come through for you the way that you believe he can. And then in the letter, in verse 27, he rescues and he saves. There's both of those words together. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He has rescued, in the larger sense again, Daniel from the power of the lions. This God is bigger than the earthly constraints we are bound by. It's fascinating, and if we had more time, we'd dig in a little bit more deeply. How these two different words that are similar in meaning but used in, in documents of the day in different ways. How God had his writer use them to accentuate the absolute sovereignty of Yahweh God. And the question is not of suffering for doing good. The question is what God can do with that suffering. Which, of course, he answered beautifully in the life of Jesus Christ, in the death of Jesus Christ, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in the closing book of Scripture, uses that moment of Jesus' crucifixion as the great moment of heaven-shattering salvation. Our perspective, I'm not, I don't want to say it's flawed, but it's limited, it's shallow. It would be like thinking that the beach is all there is of the ocean. That all over the world, the ocean is only the beach. You would never know of the whale. You would never know of the incredible pressure that is thousands of feet down. You would never know those tiny little animals that glow. You'd be missing so much, or that the forest is like the first tree you've ever seen. 
You never see the complex ecosystem that is there. The beauty and the way that oh, it, we are very, very limited. And we have to not just accept that, but trust that God's vision is whole. And that even if we don't understand or see what God is doing, we can trust that God does see what he's doing. God does know what he is doing. God is leading us forward. When he is that sovereign, then he, began, he can begin using us to bring the kingdom glory and to call others home and to cause others to write life letters differently than they would have had they not seen him in you. Well, okay, we'll save the last point for next week. <laughs> and it'll really be, it really will work to tie things together. This week's sermon is titled, Adding It Up. Capital ADD. That's not for attention deficit disorder. It was something really creative, and I've forgotten what it was. I, I had it all in my mind, and then my sister-in-law, my little brother's wife's mother passed away, and I went down to Houston to do the funeral. And I cannot find my notes as to what that cute thing was. <clears throat> but it tied into the idea of serving an ace it is my tribute to my friend Alicia, the tennis player, because when you're tied, right, when you're in a good battle and you're tied, when you win a point, they call that, well, yeah, an ad, right? It's, it's short for advantage. Yeah. But I'm playing off ad. You're one up. You have one more. Add one to your points. You have the advantage. We have the advantage when we're deeply rooted in the sovereignty of God. When we believe in the saving power of God, the rescuing power of God, the delivering power of God that is greater than this earthly moment. If I suffer in this moment, it is to my heavenly credit. And not only that's good enough for me, but yay, that's our ad, our advantage. So again, we ask, like we did last week and the week before, which king's orders are we following? The great Yahweh, the king of the universe, the sovereign of all? Or am I the king of my life? Or is the world the king of my life? Or is my work the king of my life? Or are other people the king of my life and I do everything to please them or to impress them or to be liked by them, loved by them? Are we studying and growing and living in the presence of and in the footsteps of Yahweh? Are we fighting, and I mean fighting, to stay faithful to him? And like we said last week, what are we doing to improve our game? To be better at our serves, to be confident that we can go up and have the advantage And we're volleying against the devil and his schemes. Let's serve and honor God in everything and in every moment with our words, our actions, our values, our beliefs, so that when trouble comes, let's prepare ourselves so that when trouble comes or when good times come, whether it's today, tomorrow, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 40 years from now, 50 years from now, we are at peace. We are whole because it is God who fills us and our cup runs over. Let's honor him well. Whether we are in the lion's den, out of the lion's den, working for the enemy king, or working for a dear brother or sister, let us be faithful to our great sovereign king's orders. Let's serve up aces and know that we are adding to the great king's kingdom as we play this eternal game of life where Satan volleys with us all the time.
the match, game set and match has already been won. Let's do our part. Let's trust in the faithful, sovereign God that we serve. And let's just let him do his thing through us. Song of Encouragement is Psalm 23. I picked Psalm 23 because as I was putting together the order of worship, I was also working on a funeral service for a very joyful, believing woman. And that first line, I just couldn't get it out of my head. The Lord is my shepherd. I'll not want. He's blessed us. He's filled us with everything good. Let's find our wholeness and our joy, our center in him. Let's enjoy him as he loves us, pursues us, and then works his will through us. Psalm 23, praise team, lead us.